Hello again, folks. K.R. King here, helping you homebrew your own D&D campaign. So today I'm going to continue my series on the Dungeon of the Mad Mage Level 2. Uh, I'm going to be going over the encounters that uh, you find with the players and some ideas about you know, why they were done the way they were, how to play them if you're going to play the Mad Mage, or how to use these ideas for your own uh, homebrew dungeons. And I say continue because last week I had said, oh, I'm going to be finished Next week, one more video, and actually, as I started to look at the text and see the complexity and some of the ideas here, I realized these are going to be very long videos if I try to put it all in one. So I'm going to have a few more on the Dungeon of the Mad Maid. All right, so I'm going to cover the uh, various encounters and rooms in the order that they're given in the text. Uh, just because it's a convenient numbering system. And most of the time, it sort of conforms to how the players coming from the stairs from level one would encounter them. So you're looking at this map that players are going to come down this long hallway and they're either going to turn to the east into this room 1B or continue south, possibly to go into room 2A. 1B is filled with trash and whatnot, but the players are going to hear noise. You know, they look up this hallway, uh, 1B, these... Goblins are all building this stage, very noisy. But then you have this open room here, which leads into 1D, this vast room that is this marketplace where the goblins have set up these stalls. And there are 22 goblins in this large room, two in each doorway. Uh, the players, uh, they can see 60 feet, whether with torches or infravision, they're going to see these guards. If they go in and the guards are going to see them. And potentially there's going to be an encounter. Although the interesting thing about this because the goblins are, you know, selling things at this marketplace, there seems to be kind of a, you know, an aspect of this is an area of neutrality. This is an area we don't necessarily fight in. Uh, now, again, have the players heard about this from, you know, at the Yawning Portal, uh, you know, from other people that have been in the dungeon or whatnot? Do they know already that, you know, because a lot of times goblins is just attack on sight. And in fact, it says in the text in the where they're building the stage in room 1B, if the players just ignore the goblins, they ignore them back and just keep working. And the thing is, if the players go into 1B and just decide to attack goblins, that's what we do. You've got, you know, 22 other ones that are going to come running. That's 29 goblins. And if you look at the way this is laid out, they could come up, you know, this uh, southern hallway here, another entrance here, and possibly flank the players. And if the players just, let's say they ignore the goblins in 1B, but go to 1C, there's Glom, this, you know, goblin who's been, she made them mad and they chained her to the wall and she's begging to be released and she'll help them and whatnot. Well, the goblins are going to be able to you know, see or hear this encounter and are they going to get pissed that the players are interfering in their business? And here's another important point about having a dynamic dungeon as opposed to a static one. You have these 22 goblins that are doing these market stalls. Is that all that's in the room? I mean, in theory, they're selling things. Do they have customers? Are there you know, other humanoids or NPCs or what in this room? Because if you have this, you know, frozen in time and there's 22, the, but the players are like the first customers of the day or something. Now, it makes more work for you I have with this setup in the Dungeon of the Mad Maze. But just in general, if you're going to have a marketplace kind of thing in a uh, dungeon, then you've got to have other people there that are buying things. And what's interesting here is you start to get in more civilized. It's almost like a city, underground city encounter as opposed to the usual, you know, dark and scary dungeon. All right. So at the one end of this room 1D, you have this throne where Yek who is this, you know, goblin who's been transformed by this magic circlet into a handsome human. And he runs basically this whole operation. But he might be down here in room 1E. He has these luxurious pillows he lounges on. He's surrounded by his goblin minions and four bugbear guards. And it says in there that it's brightly lit by torches. Now, since the circlet, the, the you know, abilities of I it, mean, they don't change your racial characteristics. So in theory, Yek still has, you know, infravision, but perhaps... He's doing this to emulate what he sees humans, you know, requiring light. And down here we have one of the fine fellows of Daggerford, Copper Stormforge. Uh, he's chained to the wall, and for freedom he gives this fake map. Uh, he's also neutral evil, so if he joins with the group, you can't really trust him. And it also says that his hatred for goblins such that if he's set free, he's going to try to kill every one of them. But the thing is, Yek is kind of the linchpin of this encounter because the other goblins are resentful. They, if, the, if the players don't just fight right away but somehow negotiate or whatever, goblins will come up to them and say, can you get this circlet off of Yek? They hate having to take orders from him in human form. The bugbear guards are not described as very faithful. You know, they could easily be bribed at five gold pieces to turn their back on old Yek. The point is, this has definitely a lot more negotiation and possible, 
you know, information gathering as opposed to this typical hack and slash. Before I move on from the section one, notice this doorway down here to this hallway number eight. This is a very important sort of crossroads of the dungeon. You can take this route over here to the east, a kind of circuitous route all the way to these other sections and a quick route to the stairs to the next level. But it also contains areas, you know, up to the north here and whatnot. I would think that the Yek and his crew would, you know, zealously guard this door or even barricade it. It's very important. And I'll talk more about this on a later video when I talk about entrances and exits. Now, it's possible that the players could go south and west and come upon the rooms of Calabash, who is one of Hallister's former uh, apprentices. And like almost all of his former apprentices, he is hopelessly insane. Not a good idea to work for Hallister. But first, notice this water pump in room 2A which has the ability to draw 1d4 plus 1 gallons of potable water a day. Now, this is an incredible resource. And, you know, in the real world, animals and humans are drawn to water sources. So would this be the case in this dungeon? The other thing is, you're not that far from 1d. Would people, you know, that are shopping or whatnot or selling their wares? Another thing is, you might have, you know, people playing music or, you know, doing magic tricks or telling fortunes or whatnot in this goblin room. And would they be coming over here to refresh themselves with water and making a lot of noise? But if you wander further into Calabash's uh, rooms, the first thing you do is this abandoned laboratory. There's nothing of interest here, but it serves uh, to warn the specter that's living in this kitchen area of one or two C. Hey, there's someone in the room and it comes with its three uh, animated pot uh, guardians. So thinking about running this, unless the players stay, hey, we're going to be super quiet when we enter this laboratory, chances are the specter is going to hear them. Unless you were to say, well, you know, in the pump room, it's very noisy. There's all sorts of activity. I don't know. But why are people not just wandering in here as well? Again, the static versus dynamic. You know, if you had tons of people in the water room, they would kind of wander in here. So, you know, it's a game. So then 2C is the kitchen. This is where the specter lives in one of these pots. If he doesn't attack the players going into room 2B. This is where it would be. Uh, and then finally, we have Calabash's uh, living quarters. You have under this rug a half-finished uh, summoning circle that if the players figure out how it should be drawn, they can draw it on here with paint or blood and recreate it. If that happens, uh, Calabash comes out of his uh, prison in this pocket dimension, but he is both intoxicated, he has an empty wine flask, and hopelessly insane. Now, a very interesting point of order here. It says that Calabash has a spell book that has the spells that he carries as a mage. And you look in the mage stat block, ninth level wizard, those are some nice spells. So the thing is, if you release Calabash, uh, it says that he's intoxicated. Does that affect his actions? You know, he can, uh, he will sober up after a while. So this might, but it might affect his abilities. But the thing is, he attacks anyone he sees and he's got these kind of nasty spells. He's also nuts. Does he say misty step, you know, 30 feet away, turn himself invisible and wander off parts unknown? Now, the thing is, if the players can defeat Calabash, and depending on how you want to pay that intoxication thing, they have a pretty nice spell book because the treasure that he has is a screw job. It's a 3d6 uh, lightning bolt attack. And then inside is a little note from, you know, Hallister that says, you ought to save your money. Ha <laughs> ha. You know, it's a gag. There are 20 books worth 10 gold pieces a piece, but if you've ever carried books, they're heavy. Now, room three is an atmosphere or gag room, Hallister's puppet. Uh, it's this animatron life-size, and it's working on these chemicals and stuff, all valueless. It's uh, just saying gibberish, no information, no treasure. Room four is an abandoned Xanathar a camp that doesn't have anything, a fire pit and stuff, except it has the password to go down corridor number nine when they say, you know, how many eyes does Xanathar have? Now, then you have this room five with the gate that I talked about in the last video in terms of, you know, positioning with the secret door. Do the players kind of look at this, you know, geography here and go, hey, is there a secret door? They may have found the wand of secrets on uh, level one, but of course it has three charges a day. Would they have already used one or more charges? Would they know? You know, it's kind of 30 foot radius. If they come in here and they discover the gate, you have to be eighth level uh, to go through. It takes you to level four. Uh, so they're not going to, you know, it's recommended for six level characters, but they do know about it now. And here's an important question. Often when you find a secret room like this, secret door that was one way, uh, do you use it for a short or long rest? And the question is, what's going on in this gate? Are other groups of adventurers coming in here to go through the gate? Are they appearing from the fourth level back to here? You know, what is happening? So there's a little bit of, 
you know, it's not your, it's not your true safe room. All right, and then finally in room six, you have this harpsichord. And basically what happens here, if you have a proficiency as music, you can look at the wall and there's, you know, notes written and you can play the thing. And you get a raised dead scroll in a secret compartment in the harpsichord. You can just try with a proficiency check to play. But if you fail, you take necrotic, 4010 necrotic damage, and your hand, the flesh is burned off and your hands are now uh, skeletal, which is really a nasty burn. And if you try to smash the harpsichord or whatever, the scroll is destroyed. This is a classic, very contrived woe or wheel situation because there isn't a puzzle to solve. It's just a check, right? You could, I guess, say, hey, this is Hallister's sense of humor. But, you know, there might be some that like, really? I couldn't, you're not going to let me figure this out? All right, so now down in room, the area seven, we have another of Hallister's apprentices. Uh, this is Trenzia, who, like all of them, is hopelessly insane. And furthermore, she has this lightning room uh, in 7C, and she has been transformed by Hallister at her request into this modified flame skull. She's like a lightning skull in order to protect this laboratory. Now, I really like the idea of this copper room with the electric floor and this, you know, modified lightning skull that Trenzia is. But I found the treasure here to be a little underwhelming. Basically, three lumps of copper worth 50 gold pieces each. Mm. And, you know, if you approach from the most typical, there is a there is a back entrance here, but most likely the players are going to come through this entrance. Uh, 7A is her workshop. Uh, nothing of interest here. Uh, then you go to 7B and you have these 12 copper barrels. I talked about this last time. You know, three are empty. Three have the aforementioned lumps of copper. And then six have ghouls that are just waiting in the barrels. If the players touch any of the barrels, they burst forward and attack. If the players ignore the barrels, then they stay there. Now, I found this to be a little strange because I think of ghouls as having an insatiable, you know, hunger for flesh. And the idea of them just sitting in barrels, you know, for hours or days waiting for someone to come, I don't get it. And why wouldn't they have little eye holes or something in the barrel so they could see people entering, right? It, it just, it didn't work. Now you do have three guests down in uh, room 7D that are waiting behind the door for anyone to enter. Uh, maybe they control the ghouls and tell them stay in the barrels, but then I feel like they'd be in the same room. I don't know. Something about it didn't work. And furthermore, when you go into the guests' room and fight them, all is a, a scrap of paper with some stuff by uh, Trenzia that has no value. So again, no information, no treasure, total screw jab. Or should I say resource drain? But you know, the thing about this, I really thought this copper room was cool because it has a number of characteristics. First of all, uh, Trenzia herself, instead of the usual flame skull, you know, uh, spells like a, a fireball, it's a lightning bolt. Instead of a fire ray, she has a lightning ray. But she can also, as an action once per turn, electrify the floor. And she has a guardian, a flesh golem, you know, which are nasty enough. But every time she electrifies the floor, the flesh golem regenerates 10 points. And like flame skulls everywhere, even if you defeat Trenzia after an hour, if you don't, you, you know, sprinkle her remains with holy water, uh, remove cursor to spell magic, she reappears. Even if her flesh golem is gone, she continues there to defend the room. And it's interesting because right here in red, you have this uh, chute uh, that goes down to area 13. And if you look, this is an entrance to this whole area in here, instead of having to go all the way around. Uh, from the, you know, hallway number eight. It's another one of these choke points. And, you know, Trenzia is always going to be there. Well, let's say the players do go through the marketplace and they go down this corridor number eight. Which way do they go? So they could go east into these mined out areas. Uh, they could go north and east into these uh, rooms that's number 10, which is these ooze rooms. Or they could go straight uh, north into the area nine uh, where you have uh, Xanathar's minions. So I'll start with that just from a numerical standpoint. This is called Xanathar's Watch Post. It's a little confusing to me. What are they watching exactly in this corner of the dungeon? But I suppose that they could go into the marketplace and uh, just look around, see if there's anything interesting going on. Maybe they're there to watch this cr critical crossroads uh, of hallway number eight. And a point of order, when I drew this and put these dart uh, mechanisms, these four dart traps in uh, hallway number nine, I just used a JPEG I found on the internet instead of taking a picture in the book because the JPEG was going to be have more resolution. Well, it didn't have these on there, whereas it does in the book. Something to watch out for if you use JPEGs from another source. All right, basically you have two bugbears at the eastern end of hallway number nine, and they look for the password. 
Remember, they found this in room number four in the old, uh, the other Xanathar camp. They asked, how many eyes uh, does Xanathar have? And the answer is as many stars as there are in the sky. If they answer this correctly, they're going to let them pass. If not, they leave it, uh, held this trap, and they go and get helped. And that is in 9B. You have Shun, who is a drow elite warrior, uh, and seven thugs that work with him. Now, Shun is an interesting figure because he was uh, cursed and he has been half transformed into a spider. So he has this gruesome appearance. His eight red, you know, arachnid eyes and all sorts of fangs and spider climb abilities. And in terms of the thugs, like the bugbears on level one, you have two intellect devourers. Xanathar loves to put these in his various minions who are to have taken over two of these thugs. And so that gives him that 300 foot uh, diameter, you know, sentience detection ability. Cannot be surprised. And then you have down here in you know, 9D, you've got 10 more bugbears that come running if they hear any commotion up in 9B. You know, they're this watch post, they're looking out for things. Also, it says that Shun wants to take prisoners and bring them back to Skullport, where Xanathar is apparently to impress him, or he's been asked to do this, not just kill people. And this keys into a classic D&D encounter strategy, where, and I talked about this in my video on avoiding a total party kill, in which you know, the players get captured, either as hostages to be ransomed or, you know, slaves to be used or sacrifice or something like that. Think about that if things get out of hand. And again, the treasure in here is okay. The thugs, for some reason, each thug has exactly 14 gold pieces. Shun has 100 gold pieces in a chest and a uh, five gold piece uh, set of keys. All right, so the players go up here and over to the east. They run into these rooms with oozes. And my old friends from the old days used to hate oozes. They said they were a total resource drain, you know, screw job encounter, and they kind of are. So you have this ochre jelly in room 10C that's held in stasis on this platform. Uh, and the only way it can break free is if it's touched by flesh uh, or dispel magic. And the thing is, it's formed as though it's a giant lump of gold, which will attract people to touch it. Now in this room, no treasure, no information. Then into room 10A where a giant gelatinous cube awaits. This is kind of interesting because one of the ways to mix things up, and I've talked about this in other videos, you know, changing monsters, I did one on Cyclopses. Here you've enlarged something so that it's stat block, you want much more hit points, more abilities. This gelatinous cube is now gargantuan. It, it can take in more uh, bodies into itself. It has four pseudopod attacks. And it's got improved advantage on strength checks and strength saves. Basically, Halister has imprisoned a Dugar uh, skull inside the thing, and the Dugar, you know, innate magic of being able to enlarge has now been translated somehow into the gelatinous cube. And again, after the gelatinous cube, no treasure, no information. So 10B is the old flooded room gag in which you open the doors. It's filled to the brim here with salt water. It flows out into the room. Anyone within 20 feet, I th you get a deck save, you take bludgeoning damage. But it's only 1d10, eh, not that bad. You also have a rotted corpse of a wizard and his arcane focus, a little wand, doesn't have any magic, but it's worth 25 gold. So at least something. And 10d just has nothing of interest, it's just kind of a different route to get into area 11. So room 11a is pure atmosphere. It's covered with murals that show in gruesome detail wizards going insane and being transformed into nothings. And then in room 11b, you have Midna, who is a, uh, a priestess of Shar, this god of the Forgotten Realms. She's also one of the fine fellows of Daggerford that we've talked about before, with a revenant coming after them. And she's taken up this room uh, to live in. And basically, there's a couple of reasons. One is that Halister uh, magically replenishes the room with food and drink enough for 12 people each day. And of course, her goddess is one of, you know, caverns and dark places. And finally, you know, she has in it these nine living invisible guardians that were there created by another one of Halister's uh, apprentices who went insane. Uh, they think that Midna is this uh, apprentice and so they serve her. Now her taking over this room must have taken place very recently. The fine fellows are just a day or so, I think, in front of the players. And again, they have this revenant Halith who's out to get everyone. They beat him and threw him in this pit. She actually has Halith's holy symbol so if he comes to this room and he kills her and gets his holy symbol, he goes off to the land of the dead. Now, the living servants, as defined in the book, are a little weak to me. Now, they have a plus two to hit. They have very low hit dice. And they only do, if they do hit one bludgeoning point. So they say that, you know, Midna will 
uh, tell everyone to leave her alone. And if they don't, she sends her servants to attack. But you're like, really? So I would make these a little bit tougher if I was doing something like this. Also, there's not that much treasure here. You know, the two holy symbols are 25 gold pieces a piece. And then there's this big three by five foot portrait of Halister smiling. And it's worth 25 gold, but it's kind of bulky to take out. You know, and I wonder to myself, how long could Midna really hold on to this room? Would Shun and his gang be, come down here to see what's going on and see her there? You know, the living invisible guardians aren't going to do much. And, you know, they think they would have looked in this room before and said, hey, food replenished every day for 12 people. We'll take it, right? Unless this just happened because she got in here. It doesn't say that she did anything special to, you know, open a secret door or anything. Again, the static versus dynamic. If this room is here, if Shun and his gang are here, you know, over a long period of time, they're going to know about the room or something. Maybe she just got here and did something. But you're going to have to fudge things around a little bit to make it be sensible. And then finally, the last room that I'm going to cover in this video is room 12. Basically, you've got abandoned mining equipment and another gate. Again, the gate can only be used by characters of 8th level. And this one goes to the 5th level dungeon. And as always with these both these gated rooms, even if you're high enough level to use the gate, you got to get past Halister's Elder Runes. Always a woe or wheel situation. All right, so there you have the first half of, uh, you know, kind of a description of the encounters of the second level of the Dungeon of the Mad Mage uh, with an idea towards, again, why did they do this, uh, you know, and how might it affect you designing your own dungeons or running the Mad Mage. So next time I'm going to cover the rest of the, these uh, encounter rooms. Uh, until then, if you like what you've seen, please subscribe to my channel. I'm always looking for more. Leave some comments. I love to read them. But most importantly, keep playing D&D and tell somebody else about it.